Well, let's go and get started today. And uh, before we look at your homework from last night, I want to kind of skim through chapter 15. I told you we're not going to test and quiz chapter 15. Um, a lot of it's a little bit more uh, conceptual, if you will. Um, still good, and a lot of it's even review of something we've already talked about. But I want to skim through chapter 15 with you very quickly, and then we will look at your homework. So turn to page 222 in your textbooks. Uh, talking about the laws of thermodynamics, you should be familiar with some of these already. And uh, just want to kind of skim the chapter quickly. There's not a lot of math, so this is something you certainly could read. And there are certain portions I'm going to recommend you read on your own time as well. Um, but skim through here, page 222 and 223, kind of recap what thermal energy is, that internal energy of the objects, atoms and molecules as they're moving. Um, it kind of defines on page 222 what a system is versus the surroundings. Okay, so the system is what we're dealing with, and we referenced that, right? We talked about law of heat exchange. Let's assume the system is, for instance, the calorimeter cup, the water, and the stuff we drop inside. Let's assume the surroundings don't end up absorbing any of that heat, right? So there's three different types of systems I'll reference really quickly. You don't have to take notes on this. You're not going to be tested and quizzed on this. But on page 222, you see three types of systems described. A closed system cannot exchange mass, but it can exchange energy. That would be real life, the copper cup with the, the calorimeter cup with the water and you drop the object in. Energy could be radiated outward to the surroundings. Mass isn't going to spontaneously get in. Okay, So for all practical purposes, we would say that's a closed system. If somehow you could seal the cup all around so nothing could get out. Um, I have a Yeti cup. Any of you have a Yeti brand cup? Those things can keep stuff cold a really long time. They can keep stuff hot a really, really long time. Okay, those are not perfectly isolated, but they're really close. If no energy can get in or out, you know, you leave the cup of ice water in your car and you get back at the end of the day in the summertime and 12 hours or eight hours later, it's still got ice in there there's not very much energy escaping the system or entering the system. That would be an isolated system. An open system can allow both mass and energy in. In a lot of instances, we're going to assume isolated systems for the purposes of math. And one of those ways we look at it is the universe as a whole can be thought of as an isolated system. After all, besides the universe, what is there? I mean, it's a huge isolated system, but it's not like there's anything else out there beyond our universe, right? Because the universe is all-encompassing. So within our isolated system, then, certain things that we can take note of. We already looked at this once before, but I want to touch on this on page 224, how work is related to heat, right? And obviously, we measure both of them in joules, and now we were able to come up with an actual mechanical equivalent of heat so that although the calorie can be thought of as, uh, you know, the heat required to raise a gram of water, you know, one degree Celsius from 14.5 degrees to 15, blah, blah, blah. Well, practically speaking, we could also really define the calories approximately 4.184 joules. So that's referenced there in the text. We've looked at that before. Uh, the first law of thermodynamics is mentioned there on page 225, and there's a couple of uh, ways in which we can think of it. We referenced this law once before, and it's sometimes thought of the law of conservation of matter and energy. Uh, so one way we could describe the first law of thermodynamics is that the total energy within an isolated system is always conserved. Total energy is always conserved. And therefore, if we look at the universe as a isolated system, since there's nothing else there but our universe, we could say the total energy in the universe remains constant. Another way in which we could formulate this first law of thermodynamics is this, and you see it there in, in uh, italics, that the, the change in the internal energy of any system will always equal whatever heat has been added minus whatever work was done. And that, in other words, work done has to change heat, to add heat, must equal heat added. They would cancel each other out. Conversely, if you take heat out, for instance, what a refrigerator does, right, it takes heat out of a system, well, that equals the negative work done in taking that heat out. So heat work equivalent in the process. Uh, talks about adiabatic processes. I'm not going to get into that. Interesting if you want to dig a little deeper and read through that. Jumping over to page 229, the second law of thermodynamics, you've often heard it called the law of entropy, kind of started with this description of how thermodynamics or heat transfers, how heat flows. And it says heat always transfers, right? If they're, well, first of all, can only transfer if bodies have different temperatures. 
but it only flows, just stay with me, Andre, you don't have to mark anything because you're not going to be tested on this, just kind of listening and following along as needed. But it only transfers if you have different temperatures and it always flows from high temperature to low temperature. Now think about the molecules in something of a higher temperature. What are they doing? The higher the temperature, the faster the molecules are moving. And if thermal energy always flows from the high energy to the low energy, high temperature to low temperature, that means there is more disorder that tends to overtake less order, or more, more order. Does that make sense? The cooler an object is, in a sense, right, the less disorder there is because the molecules don't have as much free movement. So if that's true, that energy always moves from high energy to low, temperature from high temperature to low, energy tends to go in the direction of causing more disorder. And that's where that term entropy comes from. Entropy always increases because higher energies have greater entropy. Now, there is the one exception that's mentioned in the book, and that is, what about when, you, when water freezes? Because here you're actually going to a lower energy state and you're also going to lower entropy at the, uh, and you're going to, yeah, lower entropy at the same time at the freezing point of water. Well, again, work has to be done to lower that. But um, other than, you know, that maybe slight exception, which again, I would say is a providential exception, um, every natural tech process tends toward disorder. If you look at the next page, it shows a few different examples, right? You put a block of ice, you just let it sit out. It's naturally going to tend toward disorder. A nice structured ice cube tends toward disorder where the water molecules naturally would just tend to be free floating. If you were to have two separate gases separated by a partition and you remove the partition, the orderliness of the two separated gases immediately begin to flow into each other, right? You dump a solute into a liquid. The solute maybe starts as a clump, but over time, Brownian motion, it'll begin to dissolve and it'll become more disordered. Everything tends toward disorder. Your bedroom tends toward disorder, right? Genetics tend toward disorder, right? We think of it at the very beginning when God made Adam and Eve, right? Perfect genetic code. And as time went on, because of the fall of man, that genetic code is messed up. It's why we have more disease and suffering and sickness in the world. More genetic mutations have taken place. Um, exploding stars, right? You've got this ball of what we presume to be plasma. The star explodes, creating a nebula of gases that's just all out there. More disorder. Now, can disorder ever be mitigated? Can you ever reverse the trend? Yes, you can make your room clean, right? You can make the water freeze. You could extract gases, but it takes guided change. It takes work. It takes intelligence to change the course of entropy. Without that guided change left to himself, everything results in greater disorder. And if you turn over to page 232, an interesting passage we won't go into, but I would encourage you perhaps to read, is, okay, how does evolution account for this? Right, if everything we see is disorder, barring the intervention of some intelligence, some guiding change, right, how does evolution explain this? And it can't, right? It makes the case for, the second law of thermodynamics specifically makes the case for intelligent design. It also makes the case for there had to be some being present, like the whole Big Bang theory. Well, number one, entropy argues that, but even the first law of thermodynamics, right? How do you have this big explosion out of which everything comes? Well, energy can't be created or destroyed. There had to have been some energy pre-existent and or matter pre-existent to cause this to happen. Where did that come from? Right? There has to be some original source for everything, right? And of course, we would say God is the original source to everything. Those two laws, I believe, though, as I'm summarizing them, you're like, yeah, we learned that before. We talked about that in earlier science classes. Okay. A couple laws you may not have talked about were the zeroth and third laws of thermodynamics. You're like, wait, the zeroth law? Okay. It's basically, it actually sounds a lot like something we talked about in geometry. If the first is equal to the second, the second is equal to the third, then the first is equal to the third. They're calling it the zeroth law of thermodynamics, and it basically explains thermal equilibrium. Remember we said when you take your temperature with an old-fashioned thermometer, or you take any temperature, right? Ms. Morse has some of those red alcohol thermometers. It's got the red dyed alcohol in the thermometer, sticks it down in there, watch the temperature go up. Okay, how does that work? Because the liquid, generally she's measuring, reaches thermal equilibrium with the glass. The glass reaches thermal equilibrium with the alcohol. Therefore, the alcohol, which expands, thermal expansion, the alcohol must be at thermal equilibrium with the liquid. Does that make sense? Because if liquid equals glass, and alcohol equals glass, that alcohol must equal liquid. That's the zeroth law of thermodynamics.
pretty straightforward. But they realized we need to state that this is in fact a law of thermodynamics so that it can justify other things. So they kind of went back. They'd already had the first law. So it's like, this is even more basic than the first law. What do we call it? The zeroth law. <laughs> All right, the third law of thermodynamics is kind of interesting. And remember we said that at absolute zero, all molecular movement would have to stop. Well, think about it. If all molecular movement had, and we already said practically speaking, okay, if you freeze something, it becomes incredibly brittle, and or incredibly hard and then incredibly brittle. So if you freeze something cold enough, it would really just kind of disintegrate. But let's suppose you had a perfect crystal. Its structure was so strong, it could withstand that. When any substance, crystal or whatever, there's that vibration. If you could freeze the crystal down to absolute zero, zero vibration, you could also remove entropy, if you will. You could remove all of that movement. And so basically the third law says that entry, entropy disorder caused by a vibration approaches zero, approaches a constant value, but that constant value is zero as the temperature of any substance approaches absolute zero. Okay? So it kind of refers back to entropy as mentioned in the second law. Any questions on that? Again, not tested or quizzed on. I just want to kind of touch on those as I'm skipping an entire chapter. But uh, for sake of time, we need to be getting into wave motion. And, uh, so, but I did want to not completely skip it. Again, I feel like if you're going to read anything at all, pages 231 to 233 really would bear some reading um, as you talk about those. Questions? All right, let's look at your homework then. And for homework last night, you had page 250. Questions 2, 3, 5, 6, and 7. Page 250. Questions 2, 3, 5, 6, and 7. Excellent. All right. Question number 2. What kind of medium can a wave travel through, Audrey? A wave can travel through an elastic medium. Waves can only travel through elastic media. Very good. Number 3. What does a wave transport? What does it not transport? Kendall? A wave transports energy but does not transport matter. Good, important to remember. Waves transmit energy, not matter. Number five, what is the relationship between period and frequency? And this is something we've already referenced, so it should kind of do it from memory, really, um, or from the reading. Michael? Uh, period and frequency are related in that one period has a certain number of frequencies. Mm -hmm. Audrey? So therefore, Kendall? Yeah, the they're reciprocals. That's how they're related. They're reciprocals of each other. Remember, F equals 1 over T from earlier. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> or T equals 1 over F, depending on which way you want to look at it. Number six, which two factors determine wave speed along a string, and what is the equation, Michael? The factors that determine wave speed are along a string are tension and um, mass per unit length. Its equation is V equals square root of F over U. Excellent job. Uh, and number seven, what is the equation giving a relationship between speed, frequency, and wavelength? Audrey? The equation for speed, frequency, and wavelength is lambda equals V over F. Good, lambda equals V over F. There's three different ways you could write it. That's one of them. Good. All right, next section in your notes. Next section in your notes. Let's talk about waves. Go and write that term down in your notes. Wave. After our uh, PCC rep came through the other day, thinking about the beach, the waves lapping against the shore, rolling in, so you close your eyes and get a bad sunburn. I mean, uh, get a tan. All right. <laughs> and, and how many of you, you say, no, I burn, I don't tan. It's just burn right away. Yeah. Um, my wife is that way. Chloe actually tans pretty well for a fair-skinned girl. She just doesn't get outside enough. Um, but anyway, um, waves. What is a wave? Here's your definition. A wave is simply a transfer of energy a transfer of energy through an elastic medium. A wave is simply a transfer of energy through an elastic medium. Elastic has the idea of bouncing back, remember. Resilience specifically has the idea of bouncing back, but I mean, in general, elastic medium. We think of a medium that can be disturbed and yet recovers its shape. For instance, um, how many of you have been in the swimming pool with friends and family, maybe younger siblings, and um, the younger sibling is unsuspecting, and you just come along and just whop on the water really hard to make it splash, and as you do, waves emanate forth. 
right? Now, if you did the same thing in a sandbox, you'd spray a little sand, but there is no wave emanating forth. Why not? Because sand, if you disturb it, it just stays disturbed, right? It doesn't bounce back and instantly flatten again, or even attempt to flatten again. But water, when you disturb it, it tends to regain its flatness. It takes a little while, right? Um, but water it tends to be elastic. Other materials as well. You disturb them, they are elastic. A trampoline, elastic medium. You disturb it by crashing on it, and it tries to recover its shape, which in turn shoots you up in the air, and it's great fun, unless you get busy. Um, or whatever disorientedness happens as you can feel your brain hitting your skull. Um, <laughs> anyway, I went to the trampoline park uh, over Christmas break with Chloe and Timmy, and I decided I might leave trampoline jumping to them. I, I don't know, I'm getting old. Um, felt weird in my brain when I was jumping. And you just get on solid ground, and you're still doing this afterward. I'm like, I'm not all about that anymore. Let them have fun. Anyway, um, but a wave is simply a transfer of energy through an elastic medium. When we talk about waves, we generally think of waves, you know, go up and down and up and down and up and down, and you get seasick and that kind of thing. These are actually transverse waves. Transverse waves. Now, the definition isn't waves that go up and down. Technically, these are waves in which particles move perpendicular to wave direction. Particles move perpendicular to wave direction. Transverse waves are waves in which particles move perpendicular to wave direction. Now, generally speaking, we think of the energy of the wave as moving forward and the particles as moving up and down. So as the particles move up and down and the wave moves forward, again, those are transverse waves. Water waves at the beach, right? You can watch the wave moving towards you. Well, what's happening is the energy is moving towards you. The water from way out there is not coming up to you. Now, right at the seashore, admittedly, there's a bit of a rolling action with the wave where water kind of gets recycled. But you go out about, I don't know, 20 yards out in the water if it's still shallow enough. For some people, it's shallower than for others. Um, <laughs> but you go out a little bit, you're really only getting the same water, and that water's just going up and down. And then the water next to it's up and down. The next water next to it's up and down. And the water is simply moving up and down. This is one reason why if you see something floating in the water out to sea, it take, seems to take forever for it to make it to the shore. Because that water isn't just moving like this. The water is moving like this, and the object is kind of bobbing up and down. Now, there is that little bit of pull, the tide as it's going in, right? It's going to pull it gradually toward the shore, but wind, of course, will blow it gradually toward the shore as well. But really, the water is just going up and down. And you see this part goes up, this part goes up, this part goes up, and we see the waves moving. But they appear to be coming toward the shore. The water is going up and down, you're moving toward the shore. I, or it, you're, the wave, the energy is moving toward the shore, and you feel it hit you, and in some cases, anyone ever been knocked down by a wave out of the beach? It, it's, it, it's a great feeling. Um, <laughs> anyway, not, not a fun feeling when you're a little kid, at least. My kids don't like that. We usually take them to the sound side where there's like no waves. It's a little boring over there, but it's safe. And, you know, it's usually warmer water too. Anyway, um, when I was in uh, high school, I did a lot of lawn jobs and I was cheap. So I bought electric. Electric stuff is cheaper than gas powered. Plus, you don't have to pay for gas. Plug into your uh, client's electric outlet, use their electricity to power your machines. Save money. And so they, they knew it, they didn't mind. Uh, but anyway, so I used electric stuff. And you know the extension cord, anyone used electric long extension cord? It kind of settles down in the grass. And so you're trying to move, and it's just kind of stuck down there. So you grab the extension cord, you just kind of flick of the wrist, flick it up, and you'll watch this ripple go up out of your hand. And the ripple seems to move all the way back toward the outlet. And when it does, you can kind of pull while it's rippling, and it kind of loosens everything up out of the grass, the rhizomes, biology class, little stems, of the creeping centipede grass, and uh, you can move the cord where you want it. Well, again, it's not that this part of the cord is leaving my hand and that cord is traveling. The energy travels down, right? The particles move up and then back down again, and then those particles move up and down, those particles move up and down. The energy is what's being carried. Does that make sense? It's not the particles that are moving. So I want to emphasize that with waves. Not matter, but just energy is what's moving. Now, in the case of the single flick of the wrist and the, the cord coat goes up and then back down, you see this up movement all the way down. It's called a wave pulse. A wave pulse is a single disturbance. A wave pulse is a single disturbance. A single flick of the wrist up real quick will cause that upward movement all throughout the cord. If I were to go up and down a couple of times, then what you would see is you'd see the, the 
cord, again, it can't go down into the ground, so that's not going to happen. That's why you don't do it. But imagine the cord was somehow like suspended through the air or something, or maybe, um, maybe you've got uh, the, uh, the cable that goes across the Chattahoochee as you're about to go a zip lining. Anyone done the zip lining across the Chattahoochee? You have, you have not, have any desire to, to zip line? You want to, you just haven't had a chance to yet. Okay. I don't know. I did a zip line when I was younger and I loved it. I don't know. I feel like I'm at the age now. I'm like, yeah, I don't need that in my life. I, I don't know. I'm just a boring person, I guess. Sorry. But anyway, so you've got that, that cable there that's suspended. Okay. If someone were at the end to start jerking it up and down, you'd see it start moving up and down as well. If you were to have back-to-back -back opposite wave pulses, that's a wave. So the wave is actually two opposite pulses. So a single disturbance doesn't fully constitute a wave, but once you get two opposite pulses, you now have a wave. If you were to keep doing up and down, up and down, up and down, you would actually see this ripple forming, and it would look like it's traveling through the, the cable because you get lots of opposite pulses. You get multiple waves. We call that a wave train. A wave train consists of lots of different pulses. Um, multiple waves in the same wave train. A series of waves, if you will. Now, it's important as we talk about waves to understand a couple of terms. One of them is the term equilibrium. Equilibrium always has the idea that everything is balanced. Everything is peaceful. Everything's undisturbed. That's what equilibrium is. It's the undisturbed state of the medium. Everything tends toward equilibrium. For instance, as you, uh, you know, pluck a guitar string, right? The string will vibrate, but eventually leave it long enough. It doesn't take that long. The string will go back to its completely undisturbed state. If you were to jerk on the cord for a minute, you'd get the, uh, the pulses to form, the waves to form, but eventually it would just go back to its undisturbed state. Even, uh, even water, right? Eventually, if everyone's perfectly still in the pool long enough, the water will go back to its undisturbed state. I, I, I remember as a little kid growing up uh, in the bathtub, you know, playing in the bathtub, because what else are you going to do? you got to make that bathtub fun before mom gets in there to actually like, dump soap in your eyes. She didn't actually do that, I just felt that way. Anyway, <laughs> I hate to get stuff in my eyes. But anyway, one of my favorite things to do is make a great big tsunami going on in the bathtub. You know, maybe have a little toy boat or something. See if you can sink the toy boat. And then, okay, now lay perfectly still and I'll see how long it took. Okay, did anyone else ever do that? See how long you could? Okay, so I'm not that weird. That makes me feel good about myself. Thank you. That or we're all weird together, okay, which is still a happy family. Don't judge people watching. All right, so we used to do this. We know what we're talking about. If you wait long enough, the, the rise and fall of the water will eventually go back to peaceful. And you learn that if the tub's more full than other times, you don't make as big a tsunami because it can actually get out of the tub. Anyone ever do that? And parents got mad? Yeah, definitely there. Do the same thing with my kids. Stop swashing so big in the tub. Anyway, <laughs> I don't want to clean up the water mess. Anyway, uh, so everything tends toward equilibrium. Well, as energy is added to it, right, as you begin to thrash in the tub, making the waves to try to sink the toy boat and the rubber duck or whatever else you have in there, right, then uh, the water, as it rises to a high point of energy, reaches what's called a crest. And I believe that's a term you're probably very familiar with. And then as the water then goes back toward equilibrium, its own inertia carries it past equilibrium to a low point of energy called the trough. The trough is the low point of the wave. So the highest part of the wave is called the crest, and the low point is the trough. Now the crest, of course, when you're at the beach, is what you're watching for, right? And uh, if you're like, you know, surfing, of course, you want to try to get up on the crest, or you watch. That's really what you're counting as you're watching the wave come. You're kind of watching the crest come towards you. One of my favorite things to do, because um, I'm very easily amused, was to uh, try to swim up as the wave was coming, try to get to it just before it reached the crest and swim up so I could reach the crest. And of course, you know, the water is coming up, and then the water goes back down and let the water just fall out from underneath me. That was kind of cool, I enjoyed that, going from the crest down to the trough because the water rises and the water falls as it moves past you. Um, if we were to measure from the equilibrium, the undisturbed state of the water, to the crest or to the trough, we would have the uh, maximum displacement of the wave, which is called the amplitude. The amplitude is the maximum displacement of the wave as measured at the crest or at the trough. The amplitude of the wave. It's the maximum displacement from equilibrium. And you're like, wait, I remember that from like the whole spring up and down. Yeah, same term and same, same definition. Just looking at it instead of springs, looking at it in the reference of or from the perspective of waves. 
Now again, remember though, it's not the particles that are moving, it's the energy that's being carried from the source, right? So if you look at the picture in your textbook there on page 236, see the boat going through. Anyone ever been at the beach when a boat decided to go racing past? And uh, you suddenly, like, you, you kind of had the waves figured out, you know, the timing, and all of a sudden, it's all over, right? It's all different waves all of a sudden because you have those shock waves coming off the front edge of the boat, uh, the bow shock, as it were. And uh, so it's, it's different waves, right? Or everything's undisturbed, and you drop a rock into a lake, and suddenly it's very disturbed. Or the pool seems so nice and calm and peaceful, and you start thrashing in it, or the bathtub, right, whatever, um, back when we fit in the bathtub. Never mind, I'm not even going to ask. All right, anyway, <laughs> I remember the day I didn't fit in the bathtub anymore. I was like, this is not, I was a little kid, but I'm like, I can't lay down in the bathtub anymore. This is awful. But it was about time to start taking showers anyway, so whatever. Um, but um, the energy, again, comes from a source, whether it's the rocks, kinetic energy as it's falling, and suddenly ripples start coming out, whether it's the boat racing through the water with its kinetic energy and the energy emanates from the source, whether it's just the wind and natural water currents that carry energy that causes the waves to form, right? The, the, the gravitational pull on the water, as, whatever, all those things are simply creating the energy and the energy transfers or flows through that medium. My hand jerking on the extension cord. This is the energy and the energy flows. So I wanted to make sure we understood that. If you were watching, for instance, um, somebody strumming on a uh, you know, zip line cable, shaking the zip line cable, watching the waves travel, you could see that if you were to pick a specific point, you could time how long it would take a complete wave, remember two opposite pulses, to pass through that point from start to finish. So if you guys are sitting at the edge of the dock or edge of the pier and you're kind of watching the waves go by, again, you're watching the energy go by. The water's just going up and down, but of course the easiest thing to spot is the crest, right? So you see there's a crest, and then a few seconds later, there's another crest. As you can see in some cases, the time it takes for a wave to pass a given point, that's referred to as period. And again, that's a term you should be familiar with from earlier. Before, it was the time for an oscillation to occur. Now we're looking at period as the time for a wave to pass a given point. Period is the time it required for a wave to pass a given point. We'll still notate it with a capital T since period is time, and we'll still measure it in seconds. So period is the time it takes a wave to pass a given point. Well, you could do that, measure the time, or if waves were really flowing quickly, uh, you could measure how many waves pass you in a single second. Now, you'd have to imagine being able to see, for instance, something like sound waves, which travel very, very quickly. But if you could see a sound wave, right, um, you could see how many waves would pass you in a given second because they move very quickly. Water waves tend to travel more slowly, particularly in deep water. But as the water waves are passing, if you could count, okay, how many per second, you'd be measuring the frequency. Obviously, in the case of water waves, you're generally getting a fractional number of waves per second. But frequency, we used to define as the number of oscillations per second. Now we're going to measure as the number of waves that pass each second. Number of waves that pass a point each second. And we'll still measure it in hertz or waves per second. It was oscillations per second was hertz, now waves per second is hertz. So again, very similar terminology to the spring motion or oscillatory motion we talked about before. Because it's still kind of the same idea, right? Repetitive motion. The waves just keep passing. Same kind of motion, if you will. Now, if we think about wave speed, which naturally thinking about how many waves per second, how fast are they traveling, how many seconds does it take one wave to pass by before the next wave comes, right? Well, then we're talking about how fast the wave is moving. Wave speed um, kind of seems like it's self-explanatory. I'll give you the definition from the book, though. The linear advance of a wave per unit time. The linear advance of a wave per unit time. Again, kind of, kind of common sense. <laughs> definitions, how fast the wave's moving, okay? Uh, the linear advance of a wave per unit time. Now, of course, with water waves, right, we'd set, we could measure it one way, but I want to think of it from the perspective of, say, uh, musical instruments, right? Audrey plays piano. Um, anyone play guitar or anything like that? I play violin a little bit. <laughs> you can tell what I'm squeaking out. Um, <laughs> you're not going to be like, whoa, he should play in the symphony orchestra, but you're like, hey, I recognize that song. <laughs> At least what it's supposed to be. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> you know this, right, with the piano. 
Um, the strings are of different lengths. There are different thicknesses. Whether you're looking at a grand piano or even the upright, which I'm presuming at home you probably have an upright. Electric keyboard, bless your heart. Maybe one day, one day. Um, pray about it, start praying about it. Honestly, truly, God can provide in amazing ways. We got a piano for free. Um, family didn't need the piano. They were gonna get ready to move, didn't need the piano. They said, hey, would y'all like the piano? So we got a piano for free, like a real one. We were thinking, okay, when Chloe's ready to start lessons, it's gonna be the electric keyboard. God provided, so pray about it. Um, now, depending on your prayers, like I was dating a girl in college and she wanted a baby grand for her house. Okay, not sure how we're going to afford that one, dear, but <laughs> anyway, then we broke up and I didn't need to buy a baby grand. Anyway, um, but anyway, um, with, with different instruments, stringed instruments, uh, we know that uh, the thicker the string, the deeper the pitch. Usually the longer the string as well, though that goes into wavelength, which we'll get to in a minute, also the, the lower the pitch, but also um, the tighter the string, right? On a guitar, you tighten to different tensions, right? Um, even without the thicker strings, for instance, Timothy has a toy, little toy guitar, it's like that big, and it's got little nylon strings. Okay, you can tighten them to different pitches, different frequencies, if you will. And the reason they make different sounds partly is the speed at which the wave travels through. It makes sense, does it not, that the tighter something is, the faster the wave will transmit, because what you're basically doing is increasing rigidity, right? For instance, um, you all know what a tightrope walker is? Now imagine if the tightrope weren't very tight. Not very rigid, right? You step on it, it starts to sag way down. Versus you step on it and it's like, it's like a bar, okay? The tighter it is, the more rigid it is. Higher rigidity is higher elasticity. It's not written on the board. Elastic medium carries waves. The higher the elasticity, the higher the rigidity, the higher the tension, the faster a wave can transmit through. But think about it. If uh, Think about the extension cord, for instance, right? It's not very rigid. It's just laying there. It's not pulled tight or anything. I jerk on the cord, and particles are displaced by the energy that I transmit. I put energy in. That energy transmits to cause particles to rise. Well, imagine I have, like a super thick rope, and it's just, just a little jerk on the rope. That's not going to do much because there's more mass to have to move, right? The more mass, the more thicker it is that has to move, the less energy is going to be able to travel through it. So it also makes sense that thicker things aren't going to transmit energy as well, or rather that waves would be slowed down by having to transmit energy through that thicker object. In the case of musical instruments, thicker strings don't allow the waves to travel through them as quickly. Now again, you can compensate for that by tightening it, right? For instance, some of this, you, you could tighten a string on a bass to the same pitch as a violin string if it didn't snap, right? If you pulled it tight enough, theoretically, but those two factors are gonna affect how quickly through a cable, through a wire, through some kind of connector, wave speed can happen. So you need to know that in a connector of some kind, wave speed is gonna equal the square root of the force of tension divided by, we're gonna use the letter mu here. Mu represents mass per unit length. Mass per unit length. It's measured in kilograms per meter, but think about it. If you had two ropes that are both one meter long and one had more mass, that means it's thicker, right? So really, mass per unit length is a fancy way of saying the thickness, practically speaking, okay? The thickness of the wire. Now, again, it's not about diameter because you could have a wire made of aluminum, you could have a wire made of, or a, a cable, if you will, made of iron, okay? The one, even if they're the same thickness, one's gonna have more mass per unit length. So, but practically speaking, we can think thickness. So thickness, you can see by being in the denominator, has a negative impact on wave speed. That which is thicker slows the wave down. Not a direct relationship, double the thickness, cut the speed in half. There's a square root relationship there. And then tension. You increase tension, you're increasing wave speed. And both of those, I think, based on what we know of musical instruments, should make sense to us. That make sense? Questions on that equation. This is really, this is the first equation for chapter 16 that you need to know. Wave speed in a connector, V equals the square root of F sub T over mu. Once you got that written down, turn to page 239 in your textbooks, and let's look at just one example problem here on page 239, example 16.1. Go ahead and read that example problem for us, if you would, Michael. What is the way to be a longer rope if it is kept at a tension of 32 newtons and it has a mass per unit length of 0.5 kilograms per minute? All right, so if we want to know the wave speed, well, let's go to our formula. Let's take the tension, which it said class was 
32 newtons, let me do this without a calculator, divide it by the mass per unit length, which it said was, well, what do you get if you divide 32 by a half? 60, oh, divide by half. If you multiply by half, you get 16. Divide by half, that's multiplying by the reciprocal. So 32 becomes 64, right? And then we have to take the square root of 64, and then we do this in our head, and we get eight. <laughs> so we get exactly eight meters per second. Now notice the units. The units work out because what is force measured in class? Newtons. What is a newton? It's a kilogram times meter per second squared. Notice the kilograms will cancel. This meter was a denominator in the denominator, which makes it a numerator, which gives you meters squared per second squared. But you take the square root of that, you get meters per second. So uh, in case you were curious, how did the units work out? But that's how we plug it in. Take the tension, divide by the mass per unit length, take the square root, and there's your wave speed. Questions on that? And again, as we're about to see in just a second, the faster the wave travels, depending on the wavelength relative, the higher the pitch might be that we hear. So um, let's talk about wavelength. Wavelength. Now, again, practically speaking, <coughs> wavelength is the length of wave. But that's not what we're going to write down, okay? Wavelength, here's how we would measure. How do you measure the length of a wave? Well, you'd measure from any point in wave, assuming we have a series of waves, a wave track, you measure from any point in one wave to the corresponding point in the next. Water waves are a good example. But the most easily spotted part of a water wave is, of course, that crest, right? Because usually that's where if there's a little curling action, you get a little of the white foam at the top from one white crest to the next white crest. You could also measure from trough to trough. You could measure from a random point on a wave to another random point, usually thought of as crest to crest. So the definition of wavelength is the distance between corresponding points, the distance between corresponding points of consecutive waves. The distance between corresponding points of consecutive waves in a wave train. Generally speaking, where we encounter waves, we will encounter more than one. So generally speaking, we are dealing with a wave train, therefore measuring from one point to a corresponding point. Again, usually crest to crest is the easiest way to see it, would give us our wavelength. Wavelength is measured in exactly what you'd expect. If we're going SI, we're going to go meters. If we're going US, we would go feet. As a wavelength, that distance between corresponding points is going to be meters or feet. Well, understand this. If uh, a short wave travels a certain uh, travels, you have a certain number of these short waves in a given second, and you have the same number of long waves in a given second, the long waves would have to move faster, right? To get their longer selves past, it's the same number of their longer selves past a given point. Does that make sense? So with frequency being measured in per second, and with wavelength being measured in meters or feet, if we put those two together, the wavelength and the frequency, that would give us wave speed as well. The length of the wave, or the distance that's traveled for each wave, divided by how many pass per, or times how many pass per second, would give us the speed of a wave. So our next equation for wave speed is to take wavelength, which we're going to represent with the Greek symbol lambda, the lowercase lambda, and we simply multiply. So we get V equals lambda F. V equals lambda F. Wave speed equals the wavelength times the frequency. Now, we need to be able to extrapolate this out different ways. I believe, uh, was it Kendall? I called on for the last homework question, or was Audrey? Which was the question, how are these related? And I believe uh, whoever it was the answer said lambda equals V over F. Well, that's true. Or you could say F equals V over lambda. Right, we're going to measure it as V equals lambda F. That's the easiest way to memorize and easiest way to work with it. But realize we could extrapolate the other two. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself because we're going to spend an entire chapter on sound. But the frequency of sound is what we hear as pitch. High frequencies are up here. Low frequencies are down there. Frequency is what we call pitch. Well, realize the length of a wave on a stringed instrument coming back to what's behind me, this, <laughs> the wavelength of a stringed instrument is determined by the length of the string. The longer the string, the greater the wavelength you can have. Well, if you increase the denominator, that drives the frequency down. And that's why longer strings tend to have a deeper pitch. But also the wave speed. You increase wave speed, that will also increase frequency. Though sound waves tend to travel at a relatively constant speed. That's why, again, increase the wavelength, 
decrease frequency. So the three things that affect in a stringed instrument, wavelength or the length of the string that allows the wave to travel, the tension and the thickness, all three things play a role. Okay, but uh, there's our next equation, V equals lambda F. Look with me at page 240. Page 240, we're actually just turning one page over. And look at the first example problem, example 16.2. Kendall, read that for us. All right, so I did it. We got to do an interesting lab, and I'm actually going to reference this later on in the same chapter. Uh, but a harmonic oscillator is just a little device that has a motor that causes a, uh, a stem to go up and down really fast. And you can change the speed of the stem. And so that's all we've got. We've got a harmonic oscillator. We've got this rope apparently attached to it, so maybe it's a heavy duty one. And it's just oscillating in such a way that uh, waves are being sent out with a frequency, it says, of 30 hertz. Okay, so that's the frequency we've set the oscillator to. And they're traveling along the rope at a rate of five and a half meters per second. So the question is, what is the length of these waves? Well, what equation class relates wave speed, wavelength, and frequency? But in this case, it says to find the wavelength. So that means we simply extrapolate out to this form. Wavelength equals V over F. So we take the wave speed class and we divide by the frequency. And that's what they did, and you see their answer came out to, uh, I don't think that was even, I think that was rounded, 0.181818, 5.5 divided by 30, oh, 0.183 repeat, okay. Rounds to 0.18, and again, wave length class would be measured in meters, because it's a length, okay? Look at example 16.3, and read that one for us, Audrey. Three E negative three, remember E negative three is milli, so three millimeters. Three millimeter wave, like very, very small waves at a high frequency of 150 hertz. Finding wave speed. Well, it gives us wavelength and it gives us frequency and it wants wave speed. What well, equation relates all three of those class? V equals lambda F. And this time they gave us the wavelength and frequency. So to find the wave speed, I just multiply. Take the 150 times the three E negative three. And they did that and uh, I believe it came out evenly to, as you see there in the book, 0.45. Notice the unit for speed, meters per second. Again, we're using V for speed. I know velocity and speed aren't exactly identical, but we'll use the V here for that. Questions on these two equations? Questions on wave of motion? Again, a lot of this should have been review for you. Is that correct? Okay, so just a couple new equations to know. These probably are new for you, or, or at least been long enough that you may have had time to forget. A lot of the terminology, though, I think is already familiar. We'll practice with some of this math in our next lesson. No homework this evening. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And when the bell rings, you'll be dismissed. You're dismissed now.